good to be here this morning. And you know, I've been sitting here, uh, sitting in the back for a while, and then came up to the front and watching all the energy and the spirit that's here in this room. That's right. And I've been sitting here watching it and realize uh, the poverty of my own childhood. And I mean it in this way. You see, I grew up in a small town, a little rural town, and there was no richness like I feel in this room. There was, uh, it was bland, there was no, the, the, the color was missing. And the churches I've served, and I go to these conventions and workshops and conferences and youth ministry, and we have our one African-American speaker comes up the whole week, we get one. You know what I'm talking about? And there's a poverty that's there. There's a poverty that's there. And I hear this band sing. So beautiful, so beautiful. And I wonder at what's been lost and what's been missed in this country when we have conferences where... Uh, we call it urban ministry, we call it inner city ministry, but there's a deep divide because I go to these other conventions and there's missing so much spice, energy, color, difference. We can't do this anymore. We can't separate these things anymore. So I just want to say that I don't know if any of you got anything out of this convention, but I sure have. I've been blessed by all of you. Yesterday, today, I've just been blessed in just being among you. I work among the frozen chosen in the Presbyterian Church. The amount of energy I've heard this morning, that's like 20 years. We get 20 years of that in one church. You know, you just wasted it all in one morning. You know, we have to dole it out just a little bit at a time over 20 years and I just keep thinking in the back they better hold back you know you don't get this much spirit just gives a little just a little you know somebody calls out in our service they need something there's a problem everything has to stop was it somebody said something is there a medical emergency or uh... I just don't understand so I stood in the back there wondering, what in the world, as the token white guy, what in the world can I say to these people? They know what they, they have it. They don't need me to say anything. And then I heard it. In fact, I think it's right here. Bart was up here doing a little contest a little while ago. And there was a person who won, a person who was chosen and they didn't know their name. I know that person. I was that person. And when I stand in front of this group, I think about the challenges ahead of us because we work among the unnamed. We work among the children who don't know their name, who leave it blank who have no idea what it is. And so we have to learn to listen, to listen for our name. You see, Jesus' ministry begins with listening. He hears his name. God only speaks twice in the Gospels, only twice, and he speaks to Jesus, and what's he say? Beloved, beloved, my beloved, that's his name. And when you know that's your name, you're free. You're free. There's a story about a researcher from Cornell University who went out to North Dakota to work with a Native American tribe. He was studying the elder system that was there. And he spent two years among this tribe, and he was so fascinated by what was happening there that he decided to bring one of these elders from North Dakota all the way back to New York City. 
This man had never been on a plane, never left his reservation, never been out of the state. They put him on a plane, they take him to New York. They put him in a hotel, never been in a hotel before. Kept wondering why you have to keep the wrapper on the soap. <laughs> the next morning after staying in the hotel, the next morning, the researcher came, picked up this Native American elder, they went outside, downtown New York City. And as soon as they stepped outside, the elder said, did you hear that? And the researcher said, hear what? There's cars, there's traffic, there's people walking up and down the sidewalks, hear what? And the elder walked over and there carved into the sidewalk was a little tree that was growing. They had trees in the sidewalks there. And he reached down at the base of this tree and he picked up a cricket. And the researcher said, now, how'd you do that? And the elder reached into his pockets, got a handful of coins, threw the coins in the air. The coins hit the ground, and people from every direction looked down. And he said, it depends on what you're listening for. Depends on what you're listening for. If there's one thing you've got to hear when you leave this conference, it's this. Know your name. Listen for it. So many of us have been listening to a name. It's not ours. We got the wrong name on the form. It's not ours. We write down our parents' name. We write down the name our friends call us. We write down our titles. Director of Youth Ministries, social worker, mother, husband, Christian. All those, they're getting closer, but it's not our name. That's not our name. And so you have to listen, and it's tough, because if you want to hear your name, what you have to do is stop and listen. And we don't like to do that. It's painful, because when you begin to listen, what do you hear? Sometimes you hear rage. Sometimes you hear anger. Sometimes you hear disappointment. Sometimes you hear sadness. Sometimes you hear depression. Sometimes you hear every name that you've ever been called. And that listening is painful, and you want to run from it. You want to get busy. You want to work. You want to do something else. I don't want to stay here and listen. Don't make me stop. But you have to come to a full stop, a full stop. And you have to listen because in the bottom of those, if you can stay there long enough, if you can wait, if you can wait out into that Jordan waters, there's a name for you. Amen. And that name is beloved. And you write it on every one of these forms. And you write it on every sheet they give you. And every form you fill it out, I know my name. Most of us are listening to fear. That's all we hear. We come to a conference like this. We were doing okay before we showed up. Now we go to all these workshops, learn all these things we didn't know, thought we were supposed to know. Now we feel worse than when we started. I know 10 more things I didn't even, wasn't even worried about. I wasn't even aware of them. There's more things I'm not doing. And we get fearful. We feel inadequate. We listen to all these speakers. Up front, they seem so together. They know the Lord. They know what they're doing. They know kids. They know how to work with them. And we feel inadequate, and we begin to listen to that. Well, maybe if I could get some more volunteers, or maybe... Uh, pizza would help you know like a pizza party or something like that you know something to distract the attention from me because I don't know what I'm doing here sooner or later somebody's gonna figure that out and get rid of me and I'm a volunteer and we get worried we start listening and the whole, all of our work with young people is filled with fear. You see it in the newspaper every day. What's the image you see of young people time after time after time? Gangs, killing people, drugs, no respect. Full of fear. Most of your ministries began in fear, sad to say. People got together, we better do something for these kids. We got to get something going for these kids. I mean, there's trouble. There's real trouble. We better get something. We got anybody, anybody who can do it, any... Anybody at all. 
And you said, I didn't really hear what you said. Okay, you. You're in. You can do it. Come on up. Okay. Anybody else? No, I just came here with my wife. Okay, your wife too. Come on up, both of you. We got two people. Anybody else going to help these troubled kids? No, you understand, my brother-in-law is picking me up. And, okay, he's in. Right? The whole thing starts with fear. The whole thing starts with fear, and we sit there shaking. I don't know how to talk to these kids. I don't know the music. I don't know, you know, there's hip-hop and rap. I didn't know there was two different kinds of music like that. I thought it was the same thing. And, and I don't understand either of them, you know? I can't hear anything. I don't... I can't do this work. And then, it's worse than that. It's worse than that. Because there's a deeper fear than our own inadequacy. There's a deeper fear than the fear of young people and the trouble that might happen to them. And I'll tell you with this story. I was sitting with my son. I have two sons, Noah and Joseph. My son, Noah, was four years old. I was singing a song to him as I was getting ready to help him go to sleep. And I was singing, I am a C. I am a C-H. I am a C-H-R-A-S-T-I-A-N. And I have C-H-R-A-S-T and my H-E-A-R-T-U and I will L-I-V-E-E-T-E-R-N-A-L-L-Y. Well, he's four. <laughs> he thinks I'm speaking in tongues. He doesn't know what this means. He says, what are you singing, Dad? I, don't know. I thought we were Christian. He says, what are you singing? And I said, well, I'm singing a song. And I told him the words, you know, it's I, I'm a Christian. And, and he says to me, what's a Christian? And this is, this is the fearful moment of a parent's life. I think I have to go find my books. Where's my theology books? I got to do this right. He's, he's asking the question. You know, usually I'm giving him the answer. He's never asking. Now he's asking. I better get my books. I better diagram this. I better start with the Old Testament. I got to work my way up to this thing. My four-year-old sitting there. And so I just, I realize he's not going to put up with that. And I, I start to put up the flannel graph, pictograph thing. And that's not going to work. And I just say, well, it means little Christ. Christian means little Christ. And it means we join Jesus in loving God and loving others. And my son Noah says, well, how do you become a Christian? And I said, well, we say a prayer. He says, okay, let's say the prayer. So we sat there, my, my two-year-old's in the background jumping on the bed, <laughs> and Noah and I get on our knees and we say, dear God, we want to join Jesus in loving God and loving others in this world. And Noah here wants to give his heart to you and be a Christian. Little prayer, and he goes, that's it? I said, that's it. <laughs> All right, let's get to bed. So we go in, we get the bed, and... I lay next to them, my, both my boys, I lay next to them as they fall asleep, and I'm laying there next to them, and it gets very quiet, and the breathing gets kind of, <sighs> it's like they're going to sleep, I can get up now. And all of a sudden, my son Noah says, Dad? I say, yeah. Jesus gets killed, doesn't he? I say, yeah. Yeah, he does, but, you know, he raises again on Easter morning, and he's, I mean, he's still with us now, and... Yeah, but he gets killed, doesn't he? Come on. I say, yeah, he does. And he says, you know, Dad, I don't think I want to be a Christian. And you know what I said? Because I'm a parent and I love my boys. I said, okay. Okay. Because I walked out of that room thinking, you're right. I don't want my boys getting killed. What was I thinking? Jesus gets killed. It's dangerous. And this is the deeper fear. The fear of God. The fear of God. If we listen deep enough to our fears, it all comes down to, I don't really want to know who God is. I like being a Christian here at the Kingdom Works Conference. It's nice here. You've got a lot of friends here. We sing here. It's good here. 
I like it here. I like it in my church and a little bit in my home, but not out in the world. No, it's scary because you could get killed. You could get killed. And we're afraid. And we stand up in front of those young people and they expose us. They expose us. You know the one kid I'm talking about. You come into that room saying, I'm going to love everybody tonight. Except that boy. There will be no love for that boy. Getting on my nerves. Won't eat my pizza. I'm always messing with my seat belt in the back of the car. Put it on or take it off. I don't care. Stop fooling with it. Yeah, that boy. And he reveals us right there. And he asks those questions. What do you mean there's a God of love? I see a lot of suffering in this world. What do you mean there's a God of love? You never knew my dad, how he treated me. And we're fearful. I don't know what to say. And so these fears, we root ourselves in these fears. And we create ministries of fears. We scare kids into the kingdom. Jesus never scared anyone into the kingdom. We scare them. Oh, you better be there tonight. I ever tell you about hell? <laughs> this is one barbecue you don't want to attend. <laughs> we scare them. Right? There's no need to scare them. There's no need to scare them. There's no need to have ministries of fear because we know our names. And our name is beloved. And we hear our names. And once we know our names, well... It's like the woman saying, love flows. It flows. We, we, we work so hard, we come to these conferences, and we learn all we don't know, and we get worried, and we get fearful. And we think, I've got to go back in that room, and I've got to love these kids, and, and there's all this uh, tension. And we go into the room and say, how am I going to love these kids? How am I going to love that one boy? I know I need to love that one boy. I'm going to go in that room. I'm going to work it up. I'm going to smile. I'm going to get the smile on my face now. Because it may not be there at the end of the meeting. I'm going to start now. I'm going to work with it. It's all this energy. We don't need to do any of that. It's the nature of love. To flow. Love flows naturally. You don't have to work at it. You don't have to make it go. You have to do nothing. Except this. And this is what's hard. Receive it. Receive it. That's the part we can't do very well. Love the boy, Lord. We pray for the boy. Love that boy. Oh, he's in trouble. Love him. And yet, if we don't know our own name, if we don't receive that love, that boy will never believe a word we say. She's just telling me stories. This is what adults do. They tell me what to do. They don't do it. Tell me I'm loved by God. She doesn't believe that. He doesn't believe that. And so the first step is to stand there at the Jordan and listen. And listen for your name. Make a full stop and pay attention. Because it's happening all the time. You're being told your name all the time. There's a woman I know, she's an Episcopal priest. She was given a job working with a junior high service in her city, Chicago. First job right out of seminary. She got this job, junior hires. And you know, in the Episcopal Church, there's this long liturgy, and there's books you've got to read, and you've got to juggle the hymn book, and you've got the prayer book, and you've got to read these things back and forth. And she gets in there with these junior hires, and she says, okay, we're going to do this service, and they all sit down, and she starts to read, and nobody responds. She goes, you guys are supposed to read that part. One kid says, we don't know how to read. None of us know how to read. We're not reading this. This is not my training in seminary. And so she starts to dang, and she says, well, I'll read your parts, and you guys repeat after me. And so she does it back and forth. But half the time, here's what she's doing. Bob, would you sit down? Bob, can you just sit down? And would you two girls, you've been giggling. There's nothing funny going on here. Okay? One more time, I'm going to put you in different pews. And then the kids go, she said, pew. And she's going back and forth, and, she, and the whole service. And so after five months, this went on every Every Sunday, every Sunday, the kids, she never gets to do anything. She's just busy trying to keep them still. They're running up with a handicapped wheelchair up and down the aisle. <laughs> and so she says, I quit. She said, after five months, she's telling me this story. After five months, I decided I'm quitting. And I went to the kids, and 
I said, you know what, tonight's my last night. I didn't give two weeks notice, this is it. I'm quitting after this. And she thought, maybe that would work. So this is my last night, so please behave this last time. This is my last night. It didn't work. Kids giggled, left, messed up. And every week she did the same thing, and she did it again. The kids come up at the very end of the service. She lays her hand on every kid, and she gives them a blessing, which she reads out of this book. Every single kid, and it takes a long time, and she gets them out, and she puts them in the van. So she does this for this very last night, puts her hand on their heads, reads the blessing over them, and at the very end, one kid says, Who blesses you? She says, Well, I go to conferences and conventions, and, you know, we have bishops there, and they do a blessing on me, and that's right. And the kids go, We want to bless you. No, we're not having any of that. I got the vans ready. We're getting in the car. No, we want to do a blessing. No, I said I got the vans. You know, you guys need to get in the van. No, we're not going. We want to give, we want to give you a blessing. She says, okay, here's the deal. You can all give me a blessing, but you're all doing it at once, not each one. And as soon as this blessing's over, you promise me you're going to go right into the vans. And we're going to take you home. This is my last night. It's already 10 minutes after 8. I want to get home. Kids say, okay, we will, we will. So she, this woman gets down on her knees, and the kids surround her, and they lay their hands on her, and they recite this blessing from memory. They've heard her say over their heads, they recite it. And this woman, as she's telling me this story, begins to cry. And she said, I never received that blessing. I said, what do you mean? She goes, the whole time I'm on my knees thinking I had no impact the whole time these kids are reciting those words, blessing me, I'm thinking about, are my van drivers still here? What if they don't all leave right now? Am I going to get the keys locked up when I get out of here? Where do I leave my keys? Do they mess up with the choir robes? Put those back together the whole time. And it's only as I'm telling you this story now, she says, that I remember what the power of what had happened, of being blessed by those kids. That happens in every one of your ministries every day. They're little things. A smile on a child's face. The fact that one kid showed up. They don't have to show up. They're not paid to show up. Somebody showed up. And we're sitting there going, where's the other 99? I made calls last night. I got on the phone. I talked to a lot of these kids in person. Not an answering machine. And you're the only boy who shows up? And these blessings happen to us all the time, and they remind us of our name. And so I want to tell you this. You don't need anything from this conference. You don't need any books, any lecture outlines, any 10 tips for whatever. You came here to this conference on Friday with everything you need. You know your name. Christ is with you. And in Christ, there is all the creativity, all the patience, all the kindness, all the love, the Holy Spirit, all the energy, everything you need. You brought that with you. You brought that with you. And you're taking it with you when you leave. It's going with you when you leave. And so don't live in fear. Don't leave this conference thinking there's more things you're not doing right. Leave this conference remembering your name. Amen. Remembering what it's like to sing in this community. Remember what it's like to share with others. Because the truth is when you get out there, you don't control the spiritual life of anyone. And as much as those parents get scared and say, do something with my kids. And as much as you stand there going, I better get something going. These kids aren't, they're not filled with the spirit. And as much as you stand there and the whole congregation looks at you going, this is our youth choir? You got three kids. Don't live in that fear. Because the truth is, you don't control the spiritual life of anyone. There's nothing you can do. Except trust, receive, listen, and remember your name. I want to end with this. Two Saturday days ago in Edmonton, Canada, There was a single mother who had a child one years old. Maybe you saw this in the news. She went to bed about 10 o'clock. She and her child, her baby, one years old, little girl, they sleep in the same bed. They went to bed about 10 o'clock. 
Sometime in the middle of the night, the little girl got up, walked out of bed, unlocked the front door, went outside. She went out. It was 20 degrees below zero. And the little girl went walking out the front door, outside, into this cold. And she walked out there. They don't know how long. But about 3 in the morning, the mother woke up, noticed her child was gone, searched the house, couldn't find her, finally went outside and found her daughter frozen. Called the paramedics. They sent fire trucks, paramedics team. They brought the baby inside. There was no pulse. They, because of the temperature of her body, they figured that she'd been frozen for two hours, that she was gone. And the fireman who first saw her pronounced her dead. And the paramedics looked at her, and they said, there's no hope. But there was one woman on the paramedics team. And three years earlier, she'd been in a little town where a child had been frozen and had died. And she had watched as they had tried everything with this child, and she remembered that they were able to revive this child. And so all the paramedics and the firemen sat around this baby and said, She's been dead for two hours. She's gone. And this one woman who knew the power stayed there. And she said, no, we're going to try some things. And she put the child in a warm bath, and she wrapped the child in wool blankets. And she held the child close to her body. And she held the child all the way in the back of that ambulance, all the way to the hospital. And she continued to work with that child. They brought in eight different doctors. The first seven said, there's no way. She's gone, and the paramedic stayed with his child. And the, the doctors tried different things, but they each doubted that anything was possible. And after two hours of trying, the baby had been dead four hours now. Naturally, her heart began to beat. Not because of anything that the doctors did. It just came. And it happened because one woman had the testimony. She'd seen lives changed before. And I look in this room, and I know that each one of us goes out. Some parents are so tired, they don't lock the door at night. They're working so hard. They're single mothers. They're so exhausted at night, and their children are out wandering on the streets. Other homes are so broken, there is no home. There's children wandering on the streets. And inside, they are so frozen and angry and upset from being abandoned. And our country says, lock them up. Lock them up. And if there may be 17, well, you might as well go ahead and execute them. 16, well, maybe. If it's possible, let's get rid of them. They're no good. They're dead. They're frozen. They're no use for the coming economy. And you're the ones who go out and say, no, I know a different story. I know a different story. I've seen change happen. You see, I was frozen in the cold, and I was brought back to life. You see, I was someone, I filled out a form. I didn't put my name on it, but now I know my name. You see, love flows naturally, and I know I'm beloved, and if I can just be near that child, it's going to happen. Not because of my control, not because of what I do, not because I get so anxious and afraid and try to make something happen, because I listen and receive, because I wait upon the Lord, because I pray, because I'm willing to walk out into that Jordan water and hear my name, and I'm going to say to that child, come on out here. If you can't come, I'll carry you. I'll bring you out into these waters. What do you hear? What do you hear? And so that's what I want to leave you with. That you have all you need. You came with it. That the power of Christ is within you. And that as we heard sung to us, it flows. It flows. Let's pray. Dear God, there's so many things we listen to, so many things we pay attention to, 
so many fears we carry inside us. We give them power to imprison us, to freeze us up. And Lord, in those times, we just stop listening. We stop paying attention. We're no longer able to be quiet and hear the whispers of your voice giving us our name, telling us who we are. And Lord, you ask us to go out among the unnamed, among the children wandering, with no warm place to sleep. And Lord, we know there's nothing we can do. It's out of our control. We barely can able to handle our own lives. So help us to be good receivers. Help us to be good listeners. Help us to wait in the midst of all the anger and pain and depression that might be within us. Help us to wait and listen and not move, to stay still until we know your God and we know your voice and we hear you call our name so that we might sit with those children and say, listen, listen, do you hear it? May every person in this room leave this place knowing they have all they need. They have all they need. In Jesus' name, amen.